the worship together and then worship the Lord through singing. This is from Isaiah 52. Please read with me. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation. Burst into songs of joy together, for the Lord has comforted his people. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Let the river 
and say I am found in you. the ushers come forward for offering. <coughs> Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this wonderful day. Thank you that it's finally cooling down. <laughs> it's been so hot and we can actually go outside and feel good and uh, feel like we can be outside without sweating like crazy. And just Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful day to worship you. And Lord, I just, I, I thank you that we are capable of being able to give to you financially, Lord. And just bless this offering, Lord. We love you so much. It's for you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> shed his own blood for my soul. Glorious thought, 
my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. It is well, it is well, with my soul, with my soul, it is well. Let's have the children come forward for the children's message with Pastor Brock. You're doing it right. with with uh, my wife Jean in San Diego what'd you do there well I went to the zoo and the safari park and also SeaWorld so I saw a lot of animals yeah but did you swim with the animals no because you came home from vacation all wet I did yeah you and Jean Oh, we sat on the front row of the, the soak zone and we just literally got soaked by the whales and the dolphins. <laughs> what did they say when you're on the plane all wet? Well, nobody really sat with us for some reason. <laughs> no, I, I, I really didn't do that. Yeah, I was joking too. But you had a good time? Yeah, I had a good time. It was a good vacation. We enjoyed seeing the animals. There's lots and lots and lots of animals. What did you do while I was gone? Well, Rat and I have... We were doing the Lord's work. The Lord's work? What's that? You know, like the golden rule. The golden rule. Oh, yeah, that's right. We were talking about the golden rule. Kids, do you remember the, kind of the, what the golden rule was when we talked about it? Anybody remember? Okay, yes? I think you got it. Go ahead. God loves us. Yeah, okay, here's, yeah, you want to get the golden rule? You do to others what you want them to do to you. Yeah, you got it, that's right. It's do to other people what you would have them do to you. And Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Do, do to others what you would have them do to you. So you were doing to others what you'd have them do to you. Yeah, Rat and I were. It was Rat's idea. Oh, that's great. I'm glad Rat is learning the golden rule. What did you guys do? Well, we went to McDonald's. And we grabbed all the yucky garbage and we passed it out door to door. <laughs> and that was Rat's idea. Yep, Rat said, he sure wished someone would do that for him. Free garbage! Is that the way you do the golden rule, kids? No. Well, but he was doing to someone else the way that he wanted them to do to him, wasn't he? Well, he should have done it to Rat. 
Oh, there you go. He should have done it to rats, huh? Yeah, so, you know, I think you're missing something from the golden rule, and that is that it needs to be something that you think the person would really enjoy, okay, or like. So we're all different, aren't we? We all like different things. Like rats like garbage. How many of you like garbage? Okay, you like real food, right? Okay. Yeah, so maybe with the golden rule, you need to be thinking about the idea that it's okay to do things to other people like you'd have them do to you, but you need to also consider the other people what they like, okay? All right. Hey, rat. Maybe we shouldn't pass out garbage anymore. Uh, we could pass out, like, fruit and vegetables and stuff like that. Rat says that'd be all right. That sounds like a good idea. Okay, you know what? This week, I want you to think about the golden rule. And let's, let's kind of say it together. Do to others, Do to others. As, you would have them. as you would have them. Do to you. And that doesn't mean passing out garbage, does it? No. Okay, do something nice. Okay, do something nice for someone this week, just like you'd like for someone to do something nice to you. <laughs> do you know what you're going to do? Did you? I just did something yesterday. I got my ears pierced. Oh, you got your ears pierced yesterday. <laughs> That's great. Maybe we should have everybody's ears pierced after the service today, right? <laughs> That's probably not everybody likes that. Yes, what do, what do you got an idea? You got your room cleaned yesterday? You know what? I think the Lord is coming back. Yes. Yes, what did you, what'd you do? I didn't do anything. I was just, um, you know, I, all we were doing is just getting ready to move. Oh, you're getting ready to move. Okay, so you were helping, weren't you? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Not sure what that is, but okay. Okay, kids, time to go to kids' church. Okay. Thanks for thanks for listening. That's great. We've been going through um, our vision as a church, and I preached a few weeks ago about loving God, and and I've been we've been focusing on application. One of the applications was to encourage you to be involved in reading the Bible and praying and connecting with God, spending uh, quality time with Him every uh, week or maybe even every day. And then uh, while I was gone, we we're gone on vacation for two weeks, and um, Pastor Luke preached on uh, loving your neighbor. Uh, or loving people, and then also last week preached on uh, making disciples or learning to follow Jesus. So um, now I'm going to go through, we have seven strategies, uh, and this is like the free Methodist vision, and, and our board is, our board of administration is going to process all this and look at our vision and our, our strategies for fulfilling that uh, vision as a church. And uh, so I prayed about it, and I decided to start going through those strategies. But I'm going to start with number seven first in the strategies that we laid out. And that has to, be, uh, has to do with multiplication or becoming like a river. And I started thinking this week about rivers. And I really grew up very close to a river. We probably were a half a mile from the river in North Dakota, Washburn, North Dakota, where I grew up. Washburn was situated on the Missouri River. And maybe I took rivers a little bit for granted, but I really had a lot of good experiences with the river, fishing and, and swimming in the river. And uh, that's kind of a, uh, very similar to the view of the river that I had out of our picture window. We lived on a hill about a half mile from the river, and that's very similar to the view. Of course, it looks smaller. That's a bigger than that. It looks smaller. We could see it from a distance, half mile. But also, we uh, lived on a little farm outside of town. My dad was a policeman, but we had always did some farming on the side. And, and uh, we had a stream in my pasture. And I couldn't find a stream that looked exactly like it online, but that comes a little bit closer to what it looked like. And I spent, we spent hours and hours, my friends and I, playing in, uh, along the stream and in our pasture. And... Um, 
That was a really uh, good memory. And we also had a little tiny spring in our pasture sticking out of the rock. Someone had pounded a pipe in there and it would drip or kind of just sometimes pour a little bit of water out of that uh, spring. And I remember my, the day my dad showed that to me and I said, what's that pipe sticking out of the water? He said, that's a spring. And he took some of the water in his hands and he drank it. He said, that's pure water. You can drink from, from that if you're in the pasture. And so I guess I was fortunate because when the Bible talks about all these different kinds of things, the river and the, the streams and the springs, I had experience with all that growing up. But water is incredibly important in the Mideast culture, which is where the, when the, where the Bible was written, is out of the Mideast culture. In fact, all the great cultures of the Mideast and the ancient ancients had rivers. I mean, even the Chinese culture had the Yangtze River. But in the Mideast, where the Bible comes from, uh, they all had major rivers, the major cultures of that time, and they were seen as sources of life. Of course, the Bible indicates that life began in Mesopotamia, uh, which later is the area that became uh, the great centers of the great kingdoms of Babylon and Persia. And the Tigris and Euphrates rivers were the central places for water and life in that culture, still are today. Here's a, here's a picture of the Tigris River. It's very beautiful. And you can see how in a desert, the, how it's so green around here. And of course, this is a modern day picture, so they're actually using irrigation too. But just like around here, we have a desert culture. We kind of understand how important water is. And wherever there's water, there's life. There's uh, also farming and, and uh, bread and all the things that go with, with water. In Egypt... Uh, the whole nation of Egypt was really dominated by the Nile River. That's where all the food came from. That's where the papyrus came from that they used for writing. And uh, it flooded every year. And so the, the Nile Delta had an, a continual source of fertile land from which they grew their crops. And so it became associated in their culture and in their religion with the Nile became associated with life. And Israel had its Nile River too, the Jordan River. It didn't flood and have silt, but it was used as a water source for this very dry Palestinian country. And um, in fact, Palestine had three very important water features. There's the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is talked about most in the Bible. And when it mentions a lake, it's, it's mentioning the Sea of Galilee. And on the northern side of the Sea of Galilee was the main area that Jesus did most of his ministry. There were a lot of medium-sized towns up there, and that's where Jesus spent most of his time. And of course, he called fishermen, who were fishermen in the Sea of Galilee, out to be his disciples. You know, almost uh, about half of the disciples were fishermen that fished on the Sea of Galilee. And of course, we see miracles there too. We see him teaching from a boat, a boat on the Sea of Galilee. We also uh, remember in the Bible the story of him walking on water. And so the Sea of Galilee was, was important in, uh, in the New Testament especially. And then there was the Jordan River which had incredible symbolism in the Bible. Uh, Israel crossed it into the promised land. And if you remember your Bible story, they started crossing it, and as soon as the feet of the people that are carrying the ark hit the water, the waters parted, similar to the way the uh, Red Sea had parted. So the Jordan River was seen as a crossing over of the wilderness into the promised land. And as you read through the metaphors in the Bible, you see this crossing over theme, uh, this crossing over the river theme is associated with crossing from death unto life. And so the Jordan River is also the place where John the Baptist, I mean, that's why they called him the Baptist, not because he was a Baptist denomination. His name was John. He was the cousin of Jesus. But he said he's the Baptist because he baptized people in the Jordan River. And it was a baptism of repentance. Uh, but it was also a baptism of cleansing because the water was seen as a source of cleansing. He baptized people by the Jordan. third feature in the Bible is the, in the Bible lands is the Dead Sea. 
If you remember your Old Testament story, is the Dead Sea, the bottom of the Dead Sea, supposedly is, is, is what we believe is where the Dead Sea is today, was, were, was the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the and Lord had sent judgment and flame and burned them up, and then later on the Dead Sea covered that area where Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were uh, cities. And the Dead Sea is, of course, called the Dead Sea because there are no fish in it. There are some microorganisms in it, but that's about all. And uh, you can, if you go online, you can see pictures of people floating in the Dead Sea uh, because it's like the Great Salt Lake Sea in Utah. Anybody been, been to that, Great Salt Lake City in Utah? And it has so much salt and minerals in it, you can just f uh, float on the top of the water. The Dead Sea is like that because water flows in, but it doesn't flow out. It flows in, and the heat, it's one of the lowest places on Earth, and it's hot, and it, it uh, evaporates, and it gets more and more salty all the time. It's stale, no fishing there. Uh, not known as a source of life. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. But as I looked at, I was looking at different places in Scripture that talk about water, uh, you realize that water is a metaphor. And a metaphor is a word or figure of speech that shows that something is similar to something else or can be compared to something else. In fact, metaphors go a little deeper than just even a simile because a metaphor is often a word picture that stands for a deeper meaning or a deeper principle. And in the Scripture, the, there are many metaphors. I mean, if you take every area of Scripture literally, like where Jesus says, if your hand offends you, cut yourself off, that wouldn't be very good, would it? Because the Scripture is full of metaphors. Now, not everything in Scripture is metaphorical. And that's the challenge of interpreting Scripture because some of the stuff in Scripture is metaphorical and some of it isn't. Some of it's literal. And, you have, and it's, so it's a challenge sometimes to know when they're talking about which. But there are many metaphors in the Bible, word pictures or stories that point to a deeper meaning. The picture that captures a spiritual meaning helps us to remember it and helps us to meditate upon the Scripture. Now, the Bible uses many water metaphors. It's interesting, though, that there's only one lake metaphor that I could find. I mean, I just typed in the word lake in my search, and there was only one that came up. Now, there might be other lake metaphors in Scripture, but they don't use the word lake. And the interesting thing about the lake metaphor is it's not a positive metaphor at all. In Job chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, one of those wonderful people that's supposedly trying to comfort Job tries to comfort him with these words. But a man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more as the water of a lake dries up or a riverbed becomes parched and dry. Now, wouldn't that bring you some comfort if you had boils on your body and your wife and kids had been killed and all your property had been destroyed? and you're laying there, wouldn't that bring comfort to you if someone said that to you? Yeah, you die, you'll never, and you, nothing will happen. You won't rise to life, nothing will happen. Oh, that's great. They were great friends, weren't they? Well, actually, they were good friends because they sat for seven days before they said anything. I don't think I could do that. I couldn't even sat for a minute without <laughs> saying something. How many are like that? You know, some of you could be like Job's friends, you know. So the, uh, the metaphor in the Bible that talks about a lake is really kind of a negative metaphor. It's like we're just all dr we're drying up and, and we'll rise no more, you know, like a dry riverbed. And it does mention lakes in the Bible, but mostly it mentions the lake or the Sea of Galilee. You know, which is kind of really odd, isn't it? Why wouldn't lakes be mentioned in a positive way in the Scripture? Lakes are good, right? I mean... If it wasn't for Don Pedro and, and the Modesto Reservoir, we'd be pretty dry and thirsty this morning because that's where we get our water from. Now, that's a picture of Don Pedro when the water's down. And uh, Ed Tidwell and I have been there very many, a lot of times on this, this very ramp. Uh, and sometimes it's that low, but sometimes, a lot of times, uh, that area in the middle is all covered up. What's, have you been there lately, Ed? Yeah. What, is, is that about what it looks like? Worse. It looks worse. Yeah. So, I mean, lakes are good, and we need lakes, and we need water. And the farmers are talking about how the almanac, the, which kind of charts patterns of water, they're saying we're going to have a really, really wet fall. And we're looking for it because we want that lake to fill up. 
And a freshwater lake, remember, has not only water going into it, but it has water going out. And that's this different than the Dead Sea or the Salton Sea is, is very similar in some ways to the Dead Sea because it doesn't have much water going out of it. If you've ever been down there, that part of California. So, but I wondered why is it that there aren't more positive metaphors in the Bible, positive mentions of lakes? I mean, they do have the Lake of Galilee, which is a major thing. And the Bible has a lot of references to water, but mostly it refers to rivers. And most of the references to rivers in Scripture are, pos are positive. It starts right out in Genesis 2, chapters 10 through 4, or chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden, and then dividing into four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire lands of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is, is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now, we still have the Tigris and Euphrates rivers as main things. Those other rivers maybe are probably renamed. But the Tigris and the Euphrates River is the birthplace of mankind, the location of the Garden of Eder, Eden. I was saying Eder, I must be hungry. <laughs> the Garden of Eden. The location of the Garden of Eden. And they have always had the meaning, or the metaphor uh, meaning, was always life. In fact, the Bible has rivers kind of as bookends. Genesis, it has the Garden of Eve, Eden, and in Revelation, it talks about the river of life flowing from the throne of the new heaven. Revelation 22, 1 through 3. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal. Don't you love water that's clear as crystal? You know, only time I've ever seen that really is, you know, in the mountains, right? And... Uh, Lake Tahoe is pretty good. You can see down about 10 feet, but I wouldn't say it's clear as crystal. The river of water of life, clear as crystal, because it's coming from God's throne, it's absolutely pure. Everything from God is absolutely pure. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Interesting source. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life. Remember the tree of life, we were forbidden in the Garden of Eden to eat of that tree. Here it's available for all so that we will live forever. Bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. That's great, isn't it? Well, we do pretty good here in Modesto, but not quite that good. That's more like San Diego where we spent our vacation, probably. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him. A picture of heaven. So mostly the rivers in the Bible are metaphors for life, but a river can also symbolize evil or a curse and death in the Bible. There are two places where it is, symbolizes evil or death. In Exodus chapter 7, verses 19 through 21, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams and canals, over the ponds and all the reservoirs, and they will turn to blood. Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. Now we know that that was one of the ten plagues that were sent on the people of Egypt so that they would let their slaves, the Israelites, go to Palestine, the promised land. Uh, the curse of turning the rivers into blood. And I've always seen that as just a punishment that was to force Pharaoh. But after I've been looking into the Scripture and seeing how water is, always has a meaning, almost always has a meaning or a metaphor, it means something else, I began to think that the river of blood has a particular meaning, a metaphor. We, because we see it again, remember there were, there were rivers, wonderful rivers in Genesis, 
the Garden of Eden, and then in Revelation, we also see bookends in the negative sense. We see a river of blood not only in Exodus, which is uh, not at the very beginning, but after the curse had come upon mankind because of sin, we see the river of blood and we see the evil Egyptians who worship all the false gods. We see a river of blood there. But we also see in Revelation, another bookend, a river of blood. Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 7. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. And this is all metaphorical, okay? Uh, it may, there may actually be literally two witnesses, but it's probably metaphorical. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from the mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time that they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss, which is, you know, symbolic of Satan, will attack them and overpower and kill them. Why a river of blood? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer to that one. Okay? You're going to need to think about it and pray about it. In fact, this is going to be a pattern for this sermon, so get used to it. I want you to, like Jesus did with his disciples, you're not my disciples, you're Jesus' disciples, but I want you to think and wrestle with the scripture a little bit. Why the river of blood in Exodus and also Revelation? Why a river of blood? What does a river of blood stand for? Perhaps one of the most beautiful of all metaphors is, in, is the metaphor of the spring of water, the spring of life. Jesus used this metaphor in conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4, verses 10 through 15, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Now, a little background here. The word living water is kind of a nickname in that culture for running water, like a stream or a spring. And so he's saying, I'm going to give you, you don't have to come here to draw water. I'm going to give you a stream or a spring so that you don't have to come here and draw water from this well. Pure, clean water. Okay? And of course, the living water has another meaning too, a spiritual meaning, doesn't it? He's saying, I can give you living water. And she understands that he's using this metaphorically because she teases back, are you greater than our, father, our grandfather Jacob? He didn't have a spring. He couldn't give us a spring. He dug a well. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Running water within them, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, and she knows by now that he's talking about something spiritual. So she responds, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The Bible says she'd been married five times. This was a, a woman who was looking for something. And Jesus broke all cultural barriers when he, a Jew, associated with a Samaritan and a woman, and he offered her himself the living water. Now Jesus used the metaphor of the spring not only at the well, but in the temple, at one of the greatest Jewish festivals, the Feast of Tabernacle, in front of a whole bunch of people, the crowds. And it says in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, 
On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let everyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Imagine what it had been like to be a Jew back then, if you know a little bit of the culture. Jesus is saying that eternal life is by coming in Him. Um, he had said in, in John to the Jews that you think that eternal life is in the Scriptures, and so you go to them, but... You refuse, but the scriptures bear witness of me, the Savior, the Messiah, and you don't listen and you don't come to me for life. So he's saying, I'm the living water, come to me. I'm the source. Everybody knows that God is the source. Imagine what they must have thought. And the other, another time he says he's calling God Father. I just realized this week that in, and I know I read that part of John many, many times where the, the Jews said, you're making yourself equal with God because you're calling God your Father. So Jesus was the one who started calling God the Father. This is our relationship with our heavenly creator, the God of all gods, the God of the universe. We can relate to him as a father. And of course, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here he's saying, I'm the living water. You come through me to come to the Father. Jesus used at least one other water metaphor. Metaphor Earlier in the ministry, he said, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will, not, will certainly not lose their reward. I always wondered where they got cold water back then. Because... If you weren't in the mountains receiving the water from a spring, it's not going to be cold. It's not going to be cold by the time you drop from a well and walk an hour home. And um, I had the fortune of being able to listen to a Bible scholar one time who explained it. And he said they found in Israel, in their, um, their uh, excavations, a water jar. And I couldn't find a picture of it, but I, I imagine it would look like that. And this water jar had two, uh, two containers in it, and one was on the outside, was just a little bit in from the outside. And what they would do is they would pour water in it, the outside layer, which is just like that, and there was another water jar inside of it. And that water would evaporate and would cool the water that was on the inside. And so... You can imagine that that was, it would take maybe, you know, a long time for that water to evaporate. So that was the really, really, really valuable water. And we don't know for sure, but just, I think we can speculate a little bit. Imagine if you had a jar, a special jar, an expensive jar that had a double layer in it, and you had some water in there, the best water you could find, and it had been cooling all day. And you're going to take the very best that you have and give it to some stranger that comes by. So when he says give a cup of cold water, he's not talking about our extra or whatever. He's talking about the stranger, the gift of hospitality, the very best that you have. You take it out and you give it to him. Give it to them. This week I've been thinking and meditating upon these questions. Why doesn't the Bible have more good metaphors for lake, lakes? Why does it talk about rivers? What's the difference between a lake and a river that the Bible wants to get across to us? This metaphor. Why does the Bible use mostly rivers? Are there any other metaphors in the Bible that have the same meaning as the river metaphor? What does the water stand for in these different metaphors? Does it always stand for the Spirit, like Jesus said with the living water, or how the disciples interpreted what He said? Or are there other meanings to it? Immediately, I did think of one very similar metaphor. 
In Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 38, Jesus says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And it's not really talking about water there. It's obviously talking about grain. You tap it down and then you keep getting more and more grain and finally it just overflows the basket. I think that's the metaphor there, but it's very similar to an overflowing type water metaphor, isn't it? And Jesus could have said this differently. He could have said, Do not judge and you will not be judged by God. Forgive and you will be forgiven by God. Overflow with forgiveness and you will have overflowing forgiveness in your life. Free others and you will be freed. Well, actually, he did say that, didn't he? Lots of times he said those kinds of things. Well, I want to lead you to water this morning. And I'm not saying you're horses, but I'm not going to make you drink. There's a saying, you can lead a, water to, a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, okay? I'm not saying you're horses this morning. But I'm going to lead you to some water, but I'm not going to make you drink this morning, okay? I want you to show your love for God by reading the Bible and reflecting on it. Ask God to speak to you and discuss what you hear from Him with someone else. Listen to what God is saying to you and be a doer of the Word. As the Holy Spirit reveals this to you or reveals something to you, listen to Him and obey. Jesus said, The one who does what I say is like the person who founded his house on the rock. The one who does not is like one who founded his house on the sand. Are things shaky? Is storm wiping you out? Place your feet on the rock. Hear and do what God is saying through the Holy Spirit in your life and He will help you. Now you could talk about these scriptures today with another believer in a Sunday school class. We have Sunday school classes that follow our service. They're all in the family room except the Spanish-speaking one is out in the connection zone. But if you're, uh, pardon? Yeah, young adults, they get together out in the courtyard and then they go out for coffee usually together. If you're not going to be here for a class of the church, I would encourage you to talk about with your family or a Christian friend this week. The scriptures are listed in your worship folder. Read it and discuss it and talk about it. And if you want to, you can, uh, you can uh, talk about it with me in the mornings because we're going to be going through these scriptures this week. Uh, I talked a few weeks ago about starting something called Morning Coffee with Pastor Brock. And uh, it would be either Facebook or email or, um, or uh, texting. And uh, I got the Facebook page going, but you've got to request to be part of it because it's a private group. And uh, so you have to, be, have to indicate to the church somehow, and you can do it in your bulletin. Your worship folder has a place where you can do that today. At, uh, right on the front cover here. You have to request it, and then we're going to send a friend invite to you, and then you can join the group. But I'm doing devotions on there almost every day of the week and making some comments and sharing. And